Thanks, Samantha. Let me take the screen and then we will start by saying hi and who we are. Oh, just a second. Here we go. I'll keep the collaborative notes open. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Day three of the workshop today, we will take Git and version control to the next level. My name is Hodvan Bast, and uh, what I like to do, I like to help researchers with their coding and programming and computation. I come from computational chemistry, and these days spend time with, with code refinery, with high performance computing, support, and teaching. And I will be together with lots of people that you see or don't see, or I will take you through the lesson today, but my co-instructor co today is Gregor. Good morning. My name is Gregor de Kassopero. I'm also part of the high performance computing group here at UIT in Tromsø, Norway. And um, in my case, I have a background in computational physics. So I was doing a postdoc here at UIT before I switched over to the HPC group. So both Radovan and I can can relate to the struggles and, and challenges that you as researchers might face uh, for anything coding related. Looking forward to this seminar. And first of all, some I took a lot of notes on my paper that I want to go through, some housekeeping. So on the bottom of the collaborative notes, you find the link to to the lesson that we will go through today. And that's the page that is on, on the upper part of my screen. And what I recommend you to do, if you had the tab open, maybe maybe you were curious about it yesterday. One thing I recommend you to do, reload the page. So F5, reload it. Make sure you get the fresh version. We have been making changes to it until late night yesterday. So it's like... It's like, you know, when you take a cake out of the oven, it's still warm. It's amazing. Hopefully it's not undercooked and hopefully we don't get stomach ache. But I think we, we have a really nice lesson for you. Uh, we we will have three exercise sessions. They will all be even, they will be longer exercise sessions than the previous days. I think we will need probably at least half an hour for each exercise, maybe longer. So today it will be really important that you communicate back to us how it is going. And we thought about all the possibilities how people can participate, so in groups or on your own. So all of this will be possible. Or expect chaos. We expect chaos. This is one of the most fun parts of the workshop because we will all start in collaborating, 100 people together. Anything can happen. So it will be chaotic. This is what we expect. This will be a lot of fun. Once we start collaborating, please remember code of conduct. I mean, we are co we are collaborating on a repository that will be public. Let's make sure that we are all comfortable. Let's not, you know, commit or send pull requests with any weird things. So I wanted to say that. Then I wanted to say that Everything today is possible to do on GitHub alone. If if you don't have any editor, if your command line doesn't work, if your authentication to GitHub doesn't really work, it's not a problem, don't give up. You can do all the exercises today on, on GitHub alone, if you choose to. We will build on the knowledge that we got in day one and day two. But even if you joined only today, there will be links and you will have time to read up. The exercises will need some time to set up. We we will give exercise least time for that. I will also show you some behind the scenes of what we need to do to make these workshop to make these exercises possible for everybody. So I will show you that in a moment. And I will now go into these con the concepts. Okay. Before we go, so someone said that Gregor's voice was a little bit low. Can you do another audio test? Or Gregor, can you say something? Or increase Am your I volume? Am I still too low if I speak like this? 
I can uh, increase the input volume if that's necessary. I guess it probably needs to be increased some. Even if it gets metallic. Okay. I hope it's better now. Sounds good to my side. Not okay. too metallic. Okay. Sorry about that. I guess what well, okay, they say it's better and keep commenting if it needs to be adjusted more later. Okay. Yeah. So it's good that this was pointed out and sounds good, no problem at all. I will now navigate in the concepts and this is this is a connection to the previous days. We will not go here through all the details. Again, what we want to do, do today is use all the building blocks, creating branches, creating commits, creating pull requests, and put them all together. And now we will be able to collaborate. We will really learn how to propose changes to repositories of other people. And we will be able to review changes contributed by others. And some concepts that we heard mentioned in the last days, and and here you can you can browse these, read up like what is a repository, what is a commit, what is a branch, what is a tag. The the one thing I want to show now here with Gregor, you know, we have pictures on it. Like what is the difference between cloning and forking? This is a question that came up a few times. And I will scroll across the text and go straight to the pictures. So those of you who will who prefer to do the changes on your computer in an editor or on the command line, at some point, there will be a cloning step today. And a clone creates a full copy. And here we have this picture of a cloud because this repository is on a cloud service, it's somewhere on the internet, and it contains branches and commits. It contains also a tag. And when you clone it, you copy everything. And something that we have seen in one of the exercises yesterday is that when we clone, all the branches are still there, but the, the branches get renamed. So there is origin slash something. And origin is the place where we clone from. It's a placeholder. And it will typically create one local branch for us to work on, which is the default branch, which will be the main branch. So one thing that is missing here in this picture is that it will also create a local branch called main from the default branch on the cloud service. So that is cloning. And how does it differ from forking? Technically, it's very similar. So technically, clone and fork are implemented in a very similar way. But if I scroll down here to the other picture, a fork is also a copy. This is something we have done on Tuesday. And this is something we will do today again. And that is making a full copy, but it stays in the on the internet. And it it is a copy from somewhere to my own user space. And it could be from a place where I cannot write, cannot where I'm not allowed to create new commits to a place where I'm allowed to make new commits. This is often a starting point to, to make modifications and it's a starting point for collaboration. And in principle, on my fork, I can do anything I like. But, but I should always have a look at the license because the license will tell me what are the things that I'm allowed to do, expected to do. But if the license allows me to do things, I can do whatever I want on my fork. I'm just here taking a pause because I see questions, which is awesome. They are down here and I also see them on the different screen. Does a commit, does a fork inherit the commit history and branches of the so-called upstream repository? Yes, it does all the branches and all the commits. But after I created the fork, it will not. So if, if the left repository here then gets 
new commits and new branches, they don't automatically go into my fork. If I don't, if I create a fork and never touch it again, it will stay frozen in time and at the time when I copied it. But today we will learn how do you update your fork and we will see that this is, this used to be more difficult. It became two mouse clicks, but we will practice that, uh, that today. We will, we will see in an exercise how our fork gets out of date and we will learn how to update it. And one more mechanism that we will see today and we will use it to, we used it to create exercise repositories and the groups will <clears throat> use it to, to create their exercise repositories is generating from a template. So you can take a Git repository on the left side with commits and branches, and you can make it a so-called template. And from it, you can generate new repositories. And if we stay in the cooking and baking analogy, it's like a cookie cutter. Like when you, when you make, if you bake cookies, maybe you have a, like this metallic cookie cutter and you can then cut equally looking cookies with it. So then the cookie cutter will be my template and I can generate repositories that look, look the same. What, you, what happens when you generate a repository is that all the history is flattened. So it will flatten all the history into one commit. So when you, when later when we practice, you will recognize that, oh, that's, that's again this, this uh, repository book, sorry, the recipe book, but there is only one commit because all the history will get flattened into one commit. But that's fine because this will be a starting point today for us. And then we do all the collaboration and the branches on top of it, on top of that. I will not talk about this part, about importing. So there are even more ways to get a repository, to copy a repository. But the, the point I want to make, and we will experience it, so we can fork and we can clone. But after we have done that, these repositories don't automatically talk to each other. We need to actively tell them to. And we do that either by pulling changes or, or by pushing changes. And this, so then on the command line, you will type git pull or git push. And then if you work on VS Code, you will click on an icon that says publish branch, but under the, under the hood, it will then push your branch. So we need to actively synchronize changes. And all the other uh, operations that we do when you work on a computer, like creating commits, creating branches, they are all local. They don't, they don't need network, only push, pull, and clone or uh, need travel over, over the network cable. Okay, another look at the questions. Uh, one question was about this flattening that I mentioned. Is it the same thing like squashing? Yeah, you could think of it. So all the, all the commits are squashed into one. So technically it's the same thing. So we don't need to really understand this today. It's only that if you wonder why is why does the exercise only contain one single commit? That's because we generate it from a template. Did I forget anything important before we move on and prepare you for the exercise? Hopefully not. So I will scroll up and go to the next episode. And I want to prepare you for the exercise. We will give you a lot of exercise time. Here, uh, sorry, here collaborating within the same repository. There is, now we want to do collaboration. There is some exercise preparation to be done. 
And depending on whether you are a team or whether you are following on your own, different steps are needed. And we, you can do that in the exercise time. So this will take a couple of minutes and that's okay. So the first part of your exercise might be to really set up this exercise repository. And what, what your team leader will do, and if you don't have one yet in your team, then, then de designate one of you to be the team leader. One of you will uh, generate this exercise from the, from the template. And if you are following on your own, we have done that already for you. But then we ask you to please tell us if you want to participate because we need to add you as a collaborator. Once you get, so here we need to be collaborators. Once you get added as a collaborator, you need, you will get an invitation from GitHub. You need to accept it. And then the other thing we recommend to do is once you get added to an exercise repository is to unwatch it. Now, let me, sh there is a screenshot here, but I want to show you, I want to show you how that looks. So I will go into some of the, this will be the exercise that we will do with the stream participants who are not part of a group. And there is this button called watch and unwatch. And here you will be able to select what kind of notifications do you want to get. And by default, it might be that by default you have this one. And then you get emails about all new issues and all new pull requests within the same repository. And maybe you don't want all these emails. So what I do and what I recommend you to do is to, to switch to the participating and mentions. It will only, you will only get up email updates about the issues that you have opened and the pull requests that you have opened, or if somebody mentions you. So this is what we mean by unwatching. So there is this preparation time to be done, but let me let me give you an overview of what is what is part of this exercise. And we have tried to make it clear of what what is possibly familiar, like cloning a repository. This is we have done it before. Creating a branch we have done before. Committing a change to a new branch, and opening up pull requests. Now I know that not everybody maybe was here and we don't expect that you remember everything. So if you are unsure about this, you can then always jump to the previous lesson and have a look, how was that again? How did I open a pull request? And then we try to crystallize here, what is the new thing? What will, what will be the new part in this exercise? We will see what is a protected branch. I will show you that in a second. We will learn how to cross-reference issues and pull requests, and we will practice to review a pull request and even open draft pull requests. So these will be the new things. And for everything that is new, you will find screenshots and explanations below. So use these hints, use these solutions. And then here are the exercise tasks that you can do with either within a group or on your own. Okay, and I wanted to show you a little bit about the behind the scenes because one thing I need to do here before everybody starts with this exercise and then you get, you get an idea of what is I will look into this one, centralized workflow exercise recorded. So you don't have to do this. I only want to show you what we what, what are the things we need to prepare here. There is a setting step where I can control. So now the team leaders will need to add collaborators. And the collaborator in this case are the individual stream participants. And now I will change the role from read to write. So from now on, actually people can change the exercise, but please try to go step by step. So I will change that to write permissions. 
the other thing I wanted to show you is that we are using protected branches. And I do that up here, branches. The main branch is protected. What does it mean? Edit. It means that hopefully, unless I forgot something, nobody can commit directly to the main branch or push directly to the main branch. And all changes to the main branch need to go through a pull request. So that could be an interesting setting also for your exercise repository. And I will do the same. I need to give write permissions also on the unrecorded one. Also here, I will give you write permissions so that you can soon start with the exercise settings, collaborators and teams. And now everybody can write to it. So these kind of steps will be the beginning of the exercise. Hopefully it is all clear. Here it's really important that you let us know how the exercise is going. So during the exercise session, please, please give us feedback. We, are, we need to give you, well, at least half an hour. So I would say that we will do the exercise until the full hour at least. We will then take a break. We might need more exercise time later. Here, let's collaborate. The goal is open a branch, create a branch, create commits, open a pull request, and then review somebody else's pull request. And let's practice to give this kind, constructive feedback. And then if you have time, try to create a draft pull request. And below, you find screenshots and also discussions, how can that be useful and how to do these steps. And I will I will practice here with the stream participants and I will also practice with, with Gego. So we will then, after the exercise, after the break, we will look at some of these steps here on stream. Now checking my checklist, but I forgot to say something essential. Uh, will we meet on Twitch before the break? Yes, but just to hear the nice jingle and just to remind everybody to really take a break, to not let the, let the exercise not consume the break. So we'll be back, but only very briefly. All good? If yes, then let, let, the, let the exercises commence half an hour, but half an hour might not be enough. Don't worry, then we will give you more time later. We will we'll get, let us know how it's going. And we will reconvene on stream in half an hour for just to announce the break. Good. Let's try it out. Let's see what happens. I'm I'm really excited about this. See you in half an hour, but see you on the notes before that. Bye. Back from the break after a nice jingle. Welcome back, everybody. So what I see here on top of my screen is this was the exercise that with the stream participants, we can see that there is activity. There are many branches, lots of commits. There are also some merges already. So some, some of these changes have been merged. So that's very nice. I can imagine that it was possibly not enough time before before the break. And here I'm looking at the feedback from exercise. It would be really helpful if you can indicate here whether this whether you are done or whether whether you are still in, in halfway. So I'm not sure how representative it is what I'm looking at there. This is in the notes. So more done is each of these O's, does it stand for like 10 people or 20 people? Or did really only five, six people indicate? It's not a problem if you got stuck because we will, with Gago here, we will demonstrate the important steps. And in the second exercise session, you will stay in the same exercise repository. 
So it took a, it took a while to set up, but you can then either continue. We will do a very similar thing, but we will focus more now on the review part and the modifying part. Thanks. So now a few more people answered. So maybe it was okay time. I suggest that let's have some fun now. You can you can all watch. You will have enough time then in the next exercise. And Gregor and me will try this. We will open an issue, open a pull request, and review it together. Gregor, how about you take the screen share from me and you create a pull request. And then I take it back and I will be the reviewer. And we will together review the, the changes. Sounds good. Yeah. So we're moving now to the second lesson. But um, as Radovan already mentioned, it's a smooth transition since it's basically the same thing, just that we will now focus a little bit more on the reviews. But I will just quickly go through the steps again that we also did in the previous lesson. So I'm now on the centralized workflow exercise recorded repository, and I will now start by creating an issue. So I want to add a recipe. So I say add my tomato spaghetti recipe. And, and why is it called issue? Because it was, I think it was invented to keep track of problems. But here we don't use it to for a problem. We use it to communicate an idea. We communicate what we intend to do before we do it, because it gives us a chance to collect feedback. Exactly, yeah. One thing I can do here is to assign uh, someone for this issue. And in this case, it's already assigned uh, me automatically. But in theory, I could assign anyone. So I could also send another one if I want, would want, um, want. But I will just yeah. assign myself here. And how do you I can use, also... uh, uh, can I just ask, how do you use this assigning in your work? So I can tell that. What what I find sometimes useful is that with by assigning, I communicate to other people that I'm working on it. Yes, it's it's very helpful if you have a, if you're working in a team where there's multiple people working on the project and you want to indicate that you already uh, decided you, that you will work on this and have already thought maybe about the problem, so that other people don't duplicate this work, so that they don't waste any time. And sometimes if you know that another person is an expert in a certain part that you want to fix of the code, for instance, then it might be a good idea to assign this person as well as a, um, maybe, um, uh, maybe for the issue, but especially for a review, that would be helpful. I can do a similar thing with labels. So I can say, this is going to be an enhancement, but if it's like, a, if there's a mistake in the code, if it's a bug, then I can indicate that here. So this can also be very helpful for others. In this case, I just choose the enhancement mm -hmm. and I will submit this now as an issue. Uh, one question that we just got on on the notes is, do we always have to open an issue before we do a change? You don't, but it can be good practice. But it's strictly speaking, it's not necessary. And for smaller things, it might be uh, not necessary at all, in my view. Yeah. So here we want to show you the technique. It's more useful for bigger changes so that when the big change is ready, it doesn't come as a surprise to everybody. And also what you want to avoid is that after spending a few weeks developing something, then you don't want to hear, uh, no, thank you, this doesn't fit at all. What would have been nicer is that you you first communicate what you intend to do, you collect feedback, and then you then you code. So it's, it's, about, it's about avoiding surprises, but for very small changes, not needed. Yeah, but that's a good point. You always want to communicate before you spend a lot of time on the problem. Um, I will now create a pull request. So I will go back to my main branch. And um, it's already showing me here that I already created a new branch. I will just quickly go to my new branch mm -hmm. where I added um, the recipe that I mentioned in the issue. And I now deliberately misspelled some things. So I, I spelled uh, or like misspelled the recipe the same way as I, as a German AK speaker, would have done it in primary school. Um, but mm -hmm. this is not the only problem in this um, in this new recipe. There's also one major um, mistake in the ingredients, which would ruin the whole recipe. So let's see whether other one will be able to spot it. Yes. So, so I will here we go... take all it, here we go a little bit step ahead because we okay. we already show you what people will do in the second exercise. But it's great, and in the commit message, 
So the commit message here was add tomato basil spaghetti recipe. And in the commit message, you did not reference the issue. It's not a problem. So it can be done either. It can be done in the commit message, but it can also be done in the pull request, which I think you plan to do. Yes, um, I created this before I raised the issue, so therefore that oh, wasn't good. possible. Mm -hmm. But I will now go back and it will already show me, it will have this pop-up here where it suggested, suggested I could now compare um, the differences in the code and create a pull request. So I will do this now. Uh, I'll just quickly check. Okay, I'm going from this branch, from my new tomato spaghetti branch into the main branch. That's what I want to do. I want to add this recipe. And now I can assign a reviewer. Let's say I, I choose the other one in this case. I can, um, again, I can choose some labels if I want. Um, in this case, I think enhancement makes the most sense. And uh, I could provide some more uh, information if I wanted to, uh, but in this case, I think it's not strictly uh, necessary. If I scroll down, it will also show me the added file or the differences. In this case, I only add some lines. I didn't delete any, but otherwise that would be shown here as well. And let's not forget to reference the issue number before you open Ah, it. yes, thank you. So I can reference it here, fix. Like there's a number of number of keywords I can use. Um, and, yeah, and, I have to... and we have them in the material. So it's fix or fixes, yeah. close, closes, resolve, resolves. Yeah, and it shows me now which, which issues I could uh, reference it to. And I have here issue number 19. So that was the one that I erased before. Hmm. So I will now create a pull request and I will give the screen then to Radovan and um, then we can discuss good practices for code reviews. Yeah, so open Maybe, it up. Sorry, I uh, forgot to mention one thing. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, okay, uh, I just I just quickly mentioned this one thing. Um, it's good practice for when you create pull requests uh, to make it life easy for a reviewer as well to try to have uh, short chunks of code that you want to be reviewed since uh, the attention of the reviewer is, is limited and for some, maybe for some complicated bugs that you want to fix, it is necessary to have like several hundreds of lines of code. But um, if possible, always keep it short because you want to, and you can also add some um, some additional mm -hmm. comments if you want here to some of the lines of your pull request if you want to communicate even more information than there is already. So this can mm -hmm. be always a good idea because like, since we don't speak head to person to person or face to face to another person, to the reviewer, Sometimes if you work with someone in a different time zone or in a different, uh, different university, it's always good to over communicate and not um, uh, not provide too little information. But I will now create this pull request. Sorry, another one, and I'll give the word to you. Oh, no, nothing to apologize. This was great. We have enough time, and it's really good that we do that here step by step. OK, keep the screen. I will now take it from you in a second. And then we do the reviewing together. Good. Now I first need to find your pull request. So I go in pull requests and now I will review, this is yours. Mm -hmm. So each pull request and each issue has a number and your pull request is the number 21 and I will now review, review it. So let's discuss what are the things that we should look at and how do you review a pull request. I have been assigned. So well, Gregor requested review for me. So that will also somewhere I got an email about it. So if I was somewhere else, I at least know. And then the thing that I look at, oh, this is about a tomato basil spaghetti. First thing I look at is the title. I might also look at which branch is it going to? Typically the default branch is going to main. This is the goal here. And the next thing I would look at is file changed. Is this also what you do, Gago, normally? Yes, I spend most yeah. of the time on the files changed tab. So let's look at what is in there, files changed. I would now browse it. I mean, overall, it looks pretty okay. There are some problems. One problem is up here. And I I could ask Gregor to fix that. So the spelling. I will show you that there is actually a better way. And that will be part of your second exercise. So let's come back to that in a moment. There is also another problem. Can somebody spot it? 
it looks like there is an unhealthy amount of salt here. <laughs> um, so this will, this is something I'm, so how do I get feedback? Well, one, one way to get feedback, if you go back to conversation, we can have a discussion here. So I could give feedback here. Uh, and it's nice to be kind. Thanks so much. Really nice recipe. But how about that salt amount? The salt amount shouldn't be reduce it. And now if I comment, it's it's here, it's uh, recorded. So we have a context here, we have a discussion thread. If I need to, and now we, us two are part of this discussion. Sometimes I need to involve an expert. So I don't know, but I can ask somebody else for an opinion. And you can then mention people. I will now not mention somebody else, but let's imagine you want to ask me for, somebody wants to ask me for an opinion. You could, you could mention, what do you think? So if you start this ad, uh, and if this doesn't make more sense because I'm asking myself, but then I will get an email and I will, you can involve other people into a conversation if you need their opinion. So I'll remove that. So that's one way to comment. The other way that might be maybe more useful is to, if I go back to fast changed, you can comment directly here. For instance, I can say here that by clicking on the plus, I can give a, leave a comment. Hmm, not sure about, about the salt amount. Add a single comment. And, but on the other hand, Parmesan cheese, nice. I really like this. Add a single comment. Because then when I go back to the conversation, it's the uh, submitter will see what line am I referring to. They don't have to guess. Imagine there are 10,000 lines. And here I refer to, to this line. You can even refer to entire code blocks. So this can be useful. And there is, you can even go a step further because I could add a comment here that spelling is not correct. Can you please fix that? But I know how to fix this. There is this plus minus symbol here, add a suggestion. So I can add an actual suggestion. So if I click on the plus minus, I can edit the code directly. So it should be tomato basil, spaghetti, hopefully that's correct. Mm -hmm. And if I now add a single comment with a suggestion, which can be on one line or it can be on multiple lines, well, let's see what how that will look when we go back to the conversation. When we go back to the conversation, there is a suggestion for a change and now Gago doesn't have to do anything except accept it or not. And I mean, I will now not give the screen back to Gago, but the formally, which should, it should not be me uh, committing my own suggestions, but now if Gago reads this, can accept this by, uh, zoom out here by clicking. Why is this not in my screen? And guess what this is? This is a commit message. A fix spelling mistake. So we can do all of this without going back to my editor, going back to my command line, commit. And now this has been fixed here. There is a new commit. And now if I look at the files changed, there is no spelling mistake anymore. And what would now, but now I'm, I'm a little bit too lazy to fix the two kilo of salt. I don't know how much it should be. 
I, I leave it to Gego. What would be what would be the mechanism now for Gego to make an improvement to the pull request? Some people, what they do is that if they see that oh there is something wrong, what they will do is that they will close the pull request and open a new one. But that's not very good because that will fragment discussions and it will fragment the context because then it will be a new pull request and we will now then we need to remember that how oh, this was a, we had also the pull request twenty one. So a much nicer mechanism to to improve pull requests and you will practice that in your second exercise is to recognize that pull requests, they are always from a branch towards another branch. And if you want to make changes to a pull request, all you need to do is to add new commits to the source branch. So if Gego adds new commits to the branch, they will get added to the pull request. And this is the way to this is the way to modify our pull requests until we are all happy here. And once once we are happy, we have resolved all the conversations, then we will merge it. And this is what we will practice. So in the second part, and let me go to the second part here. It's very similar. We are still in the same exercise repository. You don't need to set up anything new. The new thing now is we will we will focus more on the reviewing and you will you will practice the things that that we just showed you and what you can try to do is to maybe try to open a new pull request where you maybe there's a typo that is easy to fix and there is also a larger mistake and then then look at other people's pull requests in the same exercise. Try to make suggestions to their pull request. Try to try to do what I did with this typo fix, and then learn how to how to make amendments to your pull request by adding new commits to it. We can maybe give some general advice mm -hmm. for how to do reviews. One thing is spend time on things that humans are good at, by which I mean don't spend time at things which you can automize. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, if um, one typical thing, which is uh, very often done by so-called linters or um, um, uh, code formatters is things like code formatting. If you say, okay, you don't like the bracket here, you would want to split this into two lines and stuff like this. This is not something which we should focus on during the code review because we have automation tools for that. However, what, it, what we should try to do together is to get the code, which is there, to an acceptable stage and then get it merged as soon as possible so that a lot of people profit from it. Like, it's really not the case that the reviewer uh, is there to show how smart the reviewer is or to to show how he or she mm -hmm. would have implemented or they would have implemented stuff. Um, it's really kind of a collaborative effort. And in this case, it was me as kind of the, the new kind of employee in the group who, or the new member of the group who, who now created the pull request and then the senior person, uh, the very experienced person, the other one who did the review. But there is no reason why it couldn't be the mm. other way around because the purpose of a pull request is not just getting the code to an acceptable stage, but also to trans or like transfer knowledge. Um, so in my experience, one is learning a lot from reading code from other people and the pull requests are wonderful um uh, opportunity for that yes. and also maybe maybe one last comment um another one as a very experienced developer might understand whatever gets submitted quite quickly um but one quality of code or like one sign of a good code um is also readability and how easy it is to understand for someone who is not an expert in whatever the problem language might be so also the perspective of someone who is new to the team can be very valuable to improve the code itself these were such great points. So is this really a diversity that makes codes better? Great points that it's about learning. It's about the reviewer doesn't have to be the senior person. It can be the, the new colleague in your in your team. Uh, this was really such great points. And also so try can... to, so it's like try to, um... Like it's a code review, but that doesn't mean that you are not allowed to give any positive comments or like say to point out the things that you like. 
I mean, there's nothing worse for someone who spent weeks on fixing a very difficult bug, submitting the pull request, and then the only suggestions he gets are like some, um, uh, some some tiny comments about uh, some some semantics, which which really don't kind of have a large impact on the on the overall code, um, and then um, and and the pull request doesn't get uh, accepted that way. So I mean, mm. for the person who spent a large amount of time on on fixing this bug, this can be really discouraging. So I think it's really important to communicate things well and also to focus on the positive things as well because I mean as always in the internet it's it's easy to kind of point out the yeah the, uh, or like to communicate things in such a way that you would never communicate face to face. And and for somebody who joined the joined the project or just imagine how you would feel if it's your first pull request to a project, it's so important your first experience on how how they respond to you. And if if the response is very negative, and if the experience is negative, I mean, you will never come back to the project again. So especially this first contact is so important. And then it's not so it the code doesn't have to be perfect, but to to really bring them into the project and give them a good experience. So let's practice that. Let's practice the technique uh, in this exercise and. What we will do, we will give you 25 minutes, we're basically until until the hour. And then we can take a long one hour break. And here focus on suggesting changes, how to apply changes, what we just showed you. And we, we try to summarize this in this. So the tasks are very similar. We try to here distill again, what are the new things in this exercise? And you stay in this centralized exercise repository. It's only later, after the longer break, where we will move to a different repository. Just looking here at notes, whether anything unclear there. I saw a good question. It was mm -hmm. something about, is this what we do for every project or something like that? And I think it's worth mentioning. So day two, so most projects would be somewhere between day two and day three. So day mm -hmm. two was simple. You push directly. You don't worry too much. Day three, we're going through the really formal process of collaborating on something bigger. So mm -hmm. not every project is day three. Maybe not many projects are day mm -hmm. two many are probably in between there. Yes. So here we can imagine, this is a project for, we can imagine we are three people, four people in a research group. One person is the principal, principal investigator, but it's not the person who will review everything. We, we, we agree that we all help out with reviewing. Nobody, everybody is, nobody is more equal. So the model that we are trying right now could be a good fit for that scenario. Three to three to 20 people or three to 50 people. Once it gets much bigger, maybe we want to do the thing that we will do after the longer break. Good. Thanks a lot for pasting. We will then be, the exercise will be until the full hour. So until zero, zero, but then there will be a, should we then announce the break? Yes, we will announce the break just that people don't forget it. So we'll be back in 25 minutes for the jingle, and then we will announce a one hour break afterwards. Good luck, everybody. We will also help, help here. All the co-organizers and co-instructors will help with the reviewing though for the pull requests in this, for the individual stream participants. Have fun. Let's, uh, let's suggest and improve, and let's be really positive. See you later. Bye. Welcome back. We are back from a longer break. Back on stream. I hope the exercise went well. I'm really happy here with the progress we've we've done on on our exercise repositories. We will now move on to the third episode of today.
And I also wanted to say something about these exercise repositories, because in the third episode, we will use a different one. And you don't have to be worried that your recipe suggestions stay here forever. We will keep these exercise repositories for one more week. But after the workshop, we will delete them. So everything we did here will be gone. You don't have to worry about that. Also, I learned that today is the Pi Day, uh, March 14. Hopefully, yeah. this has influenced some of the recipe choices. <laughs> For the third episode, we will use a different exercise repository. We will now practice a forking workflow. So I will already navigate to it. You will set it up in in your exercise session later. There will be less to set up because this time you will not have to add any collaborators. You will not. You don't have to communicate your GitHub accounts. The whole point of the next exercise is that we learn how to modify somebody else's repository. And the somebody else's repository could, for instance, be all the code refinery lessons, which are all repositories. So now you know you will learn how to suggest changes to the lesson. And and some of you have already done that. So thanks so much for that. We, uh, we didn't have yet time to review everything. So I will now navigate to the to the episode called, oh, this one, that belong to others. How to contribute changes to repositories that belong to others. So there's a little bit of setup, but it will be easier. Make sure that you don't stay in the same exercise repository as from earlier today. Can someone add the link to the notes? My hands are a bit full here. And oh yeah, cat is there. Being okay, attacked. so everybody focus on the cat. I will paste. We are now here. So we are here, and this is maybe not in the nicest format, but at the bottom of the document, this is where we are. And a lot in the next exercise will be familiar. Again, a new branch, again, a pull request. This time, the pull request goes to a different repository, not the same repository. You, you don't have to add collaborators. You, are, you don't have write permissions in the exercise repository. And you can still suggest changes. That is really cool. And there will be a few things that are new. So every time we try to sneak in some fun new aspects, And one will be automated testing. We will show that in a minute with Gago. And then we will also show you that after the changes are merged, you will see that y your fork. So when you start the exercise, you will fork the exercise repository. You will see that at some point the fork is out of date and we will practice how to update it. And then at the bottom of the page, there is there are some thoughts about how to approach other people's repositories with ideas, changes, requests. And then hopefully we managed to have for the last 20 minutes, 30 minutes a discussion session where all of you can ask us about Git and GitHub and best practices. So that's the plan, but we will first start. So you can first just watch, we will show you the two key steps in the next exercise. And for this, Gego and me will go into this forking workflow exercise recorded. And the first exercise step will be to create a fork from it, to create your own copy. Should I give the screen to you, Gego? So as another one mentioned, we are now on the forking workflow exercises or exercise recorded repository. And I've already created an issue. Again, it's it's pretty much the same as before. Um, I'm just going to add the recipe again. 
and I'm going to create a fork, which you do by clicking on this button. So I've done that just now, a few minutes ago. And so I now went for, to the fork. For a second. Uh, mm -hmm. So you have now, you are now in your copy. Yes. Something that will, some people will ask about is, where are where are the issues here? Because now I don't see them here. And we need to remember that issues typically stay on the central, the upstream repository. So when you created the fork, mm -hmm. you copied everything, but you didn't copy the issues. And up, up there, there is no issue tab. One could enable it, but it is customary to, to track all issues and ideas and problems in one central place. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, very good point. But we will see afterwards how to link pull requests to issues in the original repository. So I'll now create a new uh, branch, which I've already done as well. And I just copied the same recipe from before into this branch. So it's the same as before um, with the corrected title. So um, the the two issues that Radovan has pointed out in the last review they are not an issue here, but we will see whether there's anything else. So I now go back to the repository and I create a pull request. So I can see here, there's this pop-up. It shows me this branch is one commit ahead of the original branch. And I can now create a pull request by clicking on contribute. And then it suggests open a pull request. Mm -hmm. So I can double check now again, whether I'm um, creating this pull request between the right branches. So I'm here on my local fork and the branch that I'm using here is the feature branch. So the, uh, the one that I just created now, and I want to merge this code into the main branch of the original repository. So I see that's correct. I can add a title. In this case, it takes the last commit message. And this time in the commit message, I've already referenced that I'm that this code is supposed to be fixing an issue. So in this case, I wrote fix hashtag one because the issue that I'm trying to fix is the first one that has been created to this repository. Also, if I would write it here, just to quickly show it, it will now show me all the issues that are listed there in the original repository. And I could choose this one again, but I've already done it here in the title, so I don't need to do that here again. But it shows me here with all the issues, or it would show me here all the issues that are existing for, that are open at the moment in this original repository. Mm -hmm. Now it's the same thing as last time. I can again choose Radovan as a reviewer. If I want to specify someone, I can add a label if I want. And then we create, uh, we click on create pull request. And we will now see how this automated tests can be extremely helpful. So Radovan, should I give the screen back to you or shall I, shall I, shall I quickly point out what is happening here? Yeah, you can, you can explain that and then <clears throat> it will go, then I will take it over and uh, okay. merge it on my side. Yeah. So now something interesting happened in this repository, we added some so-called GitHub workflows, which are is a way of implementing automated tests or automated checks for every code that is submitted in a pull request. I can click here on details. We'll show you afterwards how this is set up. And then I get here all the steps that are done in this test. And it shows me here that one test is failing. So in this case, there's only one test that is done. Otherwise there would be multiple jobs listed here on the left side. And it tells me here that in the file that I submitted, the test checks whether I have ingredients as a section, and it tells me that I don't have any. Now let's take a look at the code again, which I can do here at clicking at files changed. And it already shows me that there is something wrong. And it tells me here that ingredients is not in, uh, let me just scroll to uh, like show you um, uh, the full uh, message here. It's saying that this section is missing ingredients. And if I take a closer look, I see I actually misspelled ingredients. Therefore, the test catches a mistake. And I did this kind of on purpose because in the previous lesson, this mistake was already there. And Radovan and I were not able to spot it. And now the automated test was able to spot the mistake. Now, this, of course, is kind of a um, artificial uh, 
um, kind of tests, like usually in a code project, which would be more relevant would be to add tests that check the functions and the new implementations in your code. So whenever you submit something that changes something in the code base, you can automatically test whether it breaks anything of the previously existing um, functionalities. Um, or I can use this also very frequently, what is done very often to check whether the code formatting is correct. So these two things are usually done in uh, with these GitHub actions. But mm -hmm. again, like it in this case, which is really nice, it showed us like there is a mistake here, which we which slipped under our radar when we were doing the code review uh, manually. Okay, um, another one, shall I give the screen to you or? Yes, give me a second, I will <laughs> take the screen and let me review it. Let's now take the perspective of the person reviewing. I will just refresh my page. Um, pull request, one is open and an issue is open. That's the one. And I will make the font larger. So even without, even before I click on the pull request itself, I can see that, so the new thing this time is this, is this, so uh, there's a new symbol here. And if I could, if I would click here, I would see the same detail that, ooh, no, I clicked on the wrong thing. If I click on the, on the X or on the details, I would see the same, what Gregor has just seen. And now I know what the problem is and I also know how to, how to fix it. So let me first fix it. And then, then I want to show you how do we do this testing? How does it work? And then what, what does it make possible? And it will only, it will only be a preview because then next week we have a whole lesson on automated testing and then we can go really in depth, but let me first fix this. We know how to review changes. No, I can go, I can do it directly here. No, this one. It was the plus minus symbol in, in not ingredients, it's ingredients. And I will now, well, uh, I can keep the screen, but Gregor can commit it. So just that I don't commit and upload my own suggestions. Yeah, so maybe, maybe you can click on it, mm -hmm. but we stay with my screen. I don't even know whether something will change here automatically or I need to reload. Let's see. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah, actually it, it did update. Yeah, I just but... updated it. And now the tests are running again. If you scroll further down, you can see that the tests are running again. Oh, and they have passed. Yeah. Green check mark, all checks have passed. Then I can verify by sh going to the details. And now everything is happy here. Zero errors. So something was happening, run Python checks recipes.py. Where does that come from? Well, first let me merge it. Let me first merge it and then let's talk about the testing. Merge. Uh, just thinking whether this will do anything with our exercise. No, it's fine to merge. Now we have it on the main branch. How did the testing work? We added, and now there is a symbol, it's running again. Oh, because the testing now runs not only, we defined it to run not only on each pull request, but also on each modification of the main branch. So there's this check recipes, which is a little Python script that will check whether our recipes contain ingredients and instructions. It doesn't have to be Python and in real life, it would verify something else. So we don't have to go into this file really. 
Well, of course, if you are curious, you can click and see what is inside. The really key thing here is this folder, .github slash workflows. And inside there, we can add scripts. And we can tell them that they should run automatically every time we push or create a pull request or create a release. So I will go in there and see. We have one recipe in there. Well, maybe recipe is a confusing word. We have one script and we, we gave it a name, check recipes. You could have several scripts here. I will open it up. And this here we define on each on each modification of the main branch, on each pull request towards the main branch, do a series of steps and run it on a Linux-like container. You could here add, you could run tests on a macOS system or a Windows system. I think you could even run them on your own custom container. And the series of steps here, it's up to you to de define what it is. So what are typical things that we will want to do at a pull request? So some one thing that we will see next week is well run run a series of automated tests to make sure that functionality that the functionality is still working. Uh, then another thing you might want to do automatically is to build the documentation. We will learn how to do that next week. Spell checking. If I go back to our lesson and I zoom out, if you want to browse our lesson in PDF format, well, that PDF is generated automatically as part of a workflow at every pull request. So there are a lot, many things are possible. You could automatically package your code. You could even automatically upload your code to services like Zenodo and get a digital object identifier. I don't know what else we could do. Lots of things. So we will come back to that next week. So this is just a preview. So then when you when you practice in the next exercise and the test is failing, I mean, don't feel bad. This is a silly test that checks for certain sections. We only want to show you what is possible. Next week, we will show you how to create these workflow files for your own projects. Good. There will be a sec second interesting thing that you will see in your exercise is that the change that Grego sent and that I merged, which was a new pasta recipe, pasta, this one, it is now on the main branch in the in in this exercise repository. But if I if we maybe we can again switch perspective and Gego takes the screen from me and if we go back to to his view on his fork, we will see the change is not there on the main branch. Exactly. So I'm now on my fork, and if I take a look at the commits, I will only see the initial commit. So mm -hmm. whatever has been committed to the main branch now of the original repository is not appearing here. Yeah. If I take would take a look at that, then I would see there's already four commits. And these come from the pull request. Yes. Two, so two of them were one when one was your pull request. The second one was where we fixed the spelling mistake. And then the last one, which is the merge, it's a merge commit. So that's why we have four. Mm -hmm. And then going back to your fork, and there is we can actually see that it's behind because it tells us there this branch is three commits behind the upstream repository. And now there is a two-click way of updating it, and you will do that in the exercise. Mm -hmm. That is this click on sync fork exactly. If we want, we can compare, but I mean we already know what the difference is. It will be, it's just this one document. So I can click on update branch. And now it's identical again. 
So if I now take a look at the four commits, it will be the same as, we, uh, as in the upstream branch. Mm -hmm. So that will be a, um, an exercise step. And this was easy because uh, we have been careful of not really modifying the main branch. We It, it can be useful to Okay, I'll just capture the screen. It can be useful to consider the main branch or the default branch as read-only. For every new pull request, we create a new branch. And then, then it will be easy. Our main branch in the fork will always be either up-to-date or a little bit behind, but will never be ahead. And then updating will be without any mistakes and any problems. You could just for fun try to actually modify your own main branch and see what happens then if you try to update your fork, whether this will work and what will happen. So that can be an interesting thing to try. And now looking at the time, timing is really good. So we will soon start the exercise session and we have an exercise block here and it will be, we will give you half an hour which might be too much time, but it's also then nice to try some of these fun things out and or maybe catch up with what didn't work well earlier. A couple of things are already familiar and what is really new is listed here. And again, at the bottom of the page, we have screenshots of how, how does it look, where to click. And then if you if you finish with the exercise before half an hour, have a look at the last section where there are some thoughts and this can then form a basis for a discussion. So our the last half an hour of today will be will be a QA session where we really open 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 this up. So I suggest that we will be back at 55 past. We will be back here with a jingle. I will say a few words. We will then go into a short break. And then we will come back for a Q&A session. So prepare many cues, many questions. Have fun at the exercise. Hope, hope that works well. Again, it will really help us if you let us know whether this worked well or where you are in the exercise step. Good luck. I just need to find the right button in my remote control. See you in half an hour. Good, welcome back. It seems that this worked reasonably well. It's also really fun to see that in my network graph, I see all of your changes and you didn't even have write permissions. You didn't even have to ask for permissions to make these changes. You could suggest them, I could review them and we could all collaborate. And now we have a model to work on in principle, any repository that is open. We will take a 10 minute break and it would be nice if when we come back from the break that we have lots of questions about today, about the previous days, and then we open it up and we will try to answer everything. Maybe we can show something here live. So please come back with lots of Git and GitHub, GitLab questions. See you then five minutes past the hour. Five minutes past the hour, we'll be back here on stream. Have a nice break. My interface says that the jingle is still playing. I hope it's not, it has finished. I think we are back. Yes. Welcome everybody. Uh, we have 20 minutes left. And in these 20 minutes, we would like to open it up, please ask us lots of questions on the document. And there are some really good questions that I want to reconnect. But this document is the only way we can really see you. I hope we could just see you here and we could talk uh, talk together, but let's talk through this document and we will try to answer. Maybe we can show something, anything about Git, GitHub. And in the meantime, while the questions are coming, I can give you a preview of what to expect next week. We will, now that we have a really good basis of 
version control. This is really only one component of reproducible research. And because then when we develop our scripts and visualization pipelines, there is often more than just versions. We have environments. We need to keep track of those. We have dependencies. And we will learn that next week about how to make our environments more reproducible, how to reuse other people's code. We will talk about how to document code, how to test code, how to collaborate in notebooks, and then how to organize programs so that it becomes, again, more understandable, more usable, copy-pasteable. So all of that will be next week. Yeah, so for questions. For questions, maybe I can start with this one here, which is a really good one. So still a little bit confused about difference between a branch and a fork and a clone. And because they feel really similar. So fork, yeah. fork and clone, they make copy of the entire repository. Branches are something that li they live inside a repository. Let me go to the, the one that we just practiced with. Um, and I will go to network. But I wonder whether this is a good example. Hmm. So if I go to the network, I see that there are, so all of these colored lines, they are branches. Yeah. that live right now they actually live now inside the repository but then there are also some branches that live outside so these are forks these are copies of uh, of the repository and maybe i can clarify even better if i go to the, uh, the where we started today to these pictures we had this cloud picture Could and we say that one. just, mm -hmm. yes, they are really quite, quite similar. And if it seems like we're using them in the same sense, mm -hmm. don't worry too much. Mm -hmm. Think about the thing you want to accomplish and how to do it. And don't worry too much about the terminology. Because someone could say, oh, I have a fork of this on my computer when mm -hmm. it's a clone of it. They're both correct. GitHub has a fork, but it's yeah. probably still the same data. So yeah, yeah, I... I I agree. Like, don't worry about fork versus clone, but about the question, well, what is the difference between branching and forking? So branches are the things that live inside a repository. And then now when you start using it for your own work and in your own group, you probably don't need forks. We wanted to show you that so that you know what that means and so that you can make changes to anybody's repository almost. But for your own work, maybe start with auto forking. You can all add yourselves, add your colleagues, your students to the repository, and then you can all create branches and commits inside the same repository. And maybe that's just easier to understand. And then later, if needed, if it becomes too too big, then maybe you can decide that, well, we want to use more, rather the forking. Yeah. What about GitHub? Oh. Why is GitHub, or is, was there more? That was good. Yeah. Why is GitHub important and necessary? Is GitHub good? Why it is important and necessary and why do we teach it? because it, it is one of the standard platforms. It is likely that the code that you want to use or change is probably there. Yeah. It is popular. It is a very convenient platform. It is not the only one, but it makes some of the steps that we did today are implemented in a very convenient way. Click, 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 and it's done. You can do many of these things also on the command line. 
the, but then it's most steps are needed. It can and be most. No, I, would, I just wanted to add that most of the large software projects that are relevant to research are on GitHub, like NumPy, mm -hmm. like Julia, yeah. the language itself, SciPy, and so on. So if you're looking for something, chances are very, very high you will find it there. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it is fair to ask, is it good that one company owns this one platform that everyone uses? This is probably not great for society in general. Mm -hmm. But there have been times in the past when I've tried to teach people what I thought was best and not what was most common. And, well, mm -hmm. it's just not as useful. So, yeah, I mean, we why is it important? It's important because it enables collaboration. But other things do that also. Why is it necessary? Okay. It's not strictly necessary. It's possible to use most of the tools we have without GitHub. And even really, it's possible to use Git without GitHub or GitLab or Bitbucket or any of these platforms. You can use it completely alone. Yeah, I can so. add here that one one advantage of having your code somewhere in on the internet visible compared to just having it on your hard drive is that what if you apply later for a job that is maybe not a researcher, professor, but you apply for a job that is more focused on computing, programming, and then people will want to look at, well, what did you work on? How do you write a code? And then if you can show that here, if my projects have a look, it, it can work like a CV. Yes, definitely. The next question is also good. We have a self-hosted GitLab instance at the lab. We're wondering best practices to know when to use that GitLab or GitHub and so on. And so what are the disadvantages of GitHub? So if it, the data is very confidential, if there's security restrictions, well, you might not have whatever signed document you need to store it on GitHub itself. Hmm. Um, yeah, you and, can also comment that. Oh, go ahead. And, and well, mm -hmm. you lose the control over it. So basically, then GitHub is like, you no, know, at any time, GitHub could decide, oh, we don't want to do business with you. And then you lose access to your whole workflow. A self hosted GitLab gives you that full control and full mm -hmm. responsibility. But then on the other hand, um, the GitLab, the disadvantage is you have to do more maintenance yourself on it to even keep the thing running. And then if other people are working on it, they need a separate account. You need to give people access to this GitLab in order to collaborate with them. So it's sort of a balance. So I'd say if you're collaborating with, like if you want something where anyone in the world can contribute to your code and it's completely open, then may as well use GitHub or public GitLab or something that people have account on. Mm -hmm. If it's private stuff, then that's the time to start thinking, okay, yeah, maybe yeah. one of the self-hosted labs is better. And one one use case that could be to have what some projects like to do is that all the unpub unpublished re results everything that is not yet published that is you keep it on branches on your own server and then you can for instance decide that everything that is on the main branch has been already published mm -hmm. and this you can then so-called mirror you copy it the main branch to github it's publicly accessible, anybody can see it and, and other people can base their work on top of it. Mm -hmm. You will then at some point have a bit of, if it becomes very popular, you will have a problem to keep because you will get pull requests on GitHub, but you will also get your merge requests on GitLab and to keep it synchronized, that will be your next challenge. It's possible. Yeah. But you can then, it can be practical to have one branch which is public, published, and define that as a base of work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Should we move on to the next one? Check is not so clear to me. What is a check? Uh, Who creates it and how does it work? 
I if guess. that refers to the automated tests so that you know the green check and the we introduced it without much explaining we wanted to show you only that it's possible to do um we will learn how to really create it and how this really works next week it, right right now in short is that at least on github if you put a script into dot github slash workflows you can define that it should be run at certain events and this is what we did there yeah but more details next week this is only now we know it's possible next week we will see how to do it yeah maybe like long story short it's something like this so last night we said should we give a demonstration of the check mark so we wrote some quick code that would it's a python script it's called the check recipe.py it runs and it gives an error message if there's warnings and then we would tell github okay for every pull request and every push then run this code and see like report the status and that's basically it so mm -hmm. um it can be whatever you want and there's many things that are already made but yeah i mean next in exactly one week from now we'll go over this in much more detail mm -hmm. so let's talk then yes thanks for this one feedback questions we have them at the bottom so you can already start filling out feedback what did you like about today what is there to improve so this is at the end of the document so i will scroll down have a quick peek here and then scroll back up again if you like what we're doing today, it's even more of this next week. So next week will be more demo oriented, but if this week was learning version control, next week is using it in practice, mm -hmm. which of course is the best way to really learn it. Yeah. What's the practical difference between branching and pulling versus forking and pulling? Mm -hmm. The fork you only need if you cannot if you are not allowed to create branches in the repository. And of course you can ask the people. So if these are people you know, you can ask them, can you add me? Um, if you don't have write permissions, then your only option is to, and if you want to have the copy on, on GitHub, your only option is to fork. And then fork is interesting for very big projects because then it would be all chaos if there were 2000 branches inside the same repository. Mm, yeah. How user friendly is the GitHub interface for beginner developers? Yeah, what do you think? I think it is they they did a lot of improvement in terms of convenience, and so is GitLab. These services are they put a lot of thought and a lot of work into into convenience. Sometimes it can create a bit of since it can hide the technical details and it can sometimes add a bit of to confusion we have seen it when we talked about tag and release mm -hmm. um, but i don't know what do you all think i mean should we give some history of how we ended up where we are now so last time we gave this we started straight from the command line and the github mm -hmm. web interface was sort of an afterthought or a side thing we would look at mm -hmm. and compared to that the github web interface is pretty easy of course it's true that it's not perfect and if you start with github web interface and move to local work it's hard but i mean at least mm -hmm. it allows you to do many things without lots of like set up yourself so mm -hmm. Yeah, our hope was that, well, we know that everybody, people work really differently. Just if we would do a poll, there would probably be 10 different editors. <laughs> um, yeah. And and we, we don't want to tell people like, this is the best editor and this is the best platform. Our goal is to give you all an understanding of what is, what is a commit, what is a branch, what is code review. And we were hoping that by starting with on GitHub with an existing repository that you get this understanding sooner 
and that we get this understanding without frustrations. And we have seen in past workshops is that it's pity if somebody is really excited about learning it, but then gets stuck about something very technical in the command line, which they have never seen before, which is unrelated to Git. And we wanted to we wanted to try something new, and hopefully it was an improvement. But that's why we need the feedback. What what I like about this project is that we experiment. So this was an experiment, and um, this was also today's lesson was an experiment. How important is GitHub for job applications? So for programming jobs, I think it is very important, and not GitHub itself, but the fact that you can somewhere show your code. Like a portfolio, yeah. basically, like it says there. Oh, yeah. 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 So, you know, is it GitHub or whatever? There. I can give an uh, example. So we were looking on hiring someone, and one of the job applications had actually submitted a pull request to some relatively large project. Mm -hmm. uh, what was that? Matplotlib or something like that. And this was really impressive because it shows that one, they really know how to use version control well enough, so they're not going to be afraid of the simpler stuff we do. And they were able to navigate the like the requirements for submitting it and how to interact with people and so on. So we saw both the social and the technical skills based on this public work. Mm -hmm. So I'd say pretty important. Yeah. Can you comment on test-driven development and its application in research? More about that next week, but I can so say now briefly that... Can, can we define test-driven development first? So what so is test-driven development? It would be that... So imagine you have a code and then you have a way to test it. But now imagine you write the test before you even write the code. So that sounds strange, but the approach here is that, and there is also documentation driven development. The approach is that you first describe what the code should do in documentation or in a test, and then you write the code so that the test works. The advantage of it is that it can make you think a little bit more about how it should behave what do we want it to do? We think maybe a little bit more about the interface. Yeah. Instead of starting coding and then it's not, it doesn't mean that this is the best approach. It's 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 an approach, it's complementary. Often we want to find a balance and then next week we will have an exercise on that, I think. And yes. it really helps you modularize your code. So having mm -hmm. small functions, small classes, and so on, instead mm -hmm. of one humongous mm -hmm. one, which typically results from just starting and not knowing exactly where to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess there's test-driven development and using any kind of tests. And, well, we talk about all of this next week. Mm -hmm. So it has its place in research, for yeah. sure. Whenever you've but done it... research before, like research code, when you were an academic researcher, did you do? Uh, did you have tests for most of your stuff? Like, let's say before you became like you are now, the level of professionalness. Like, how much of your research code was well tested? Should I start, um, or you another one? Yeah, go ahead, okay, go. Um, so during my postdoc, I probably procrastinated the whole year with like turning all of our code into packages in Python. And oh, okay. These all had tests at the end, at least at the beginning, they didn't. Yeah. So I think for these parts of the code, which were not used only by myself, but by the whole group, probably mm -hmm. also by people outside of the group, um, for, for that case, it was very useful to add tests. Yeah. But for like scripts that I had for my everyday work, I have to admit like tests were sometimes not uh... important. Yeah. So it's like the bigger projects you tested better and the smaller yeah. ones were. Okay. But I mean, that's how it should be, shouldn't it? You know, the more people that are using it, the more refined it has to be and mm. so on. So 
yeah. Good. Should we talk about so difference between sync and merge? And maybe this refers to the sync mm -hmm. when we were updating forks. Right. And if that yeah. was it, then actually uh, under the hood, so under the dice button and the word sync, under the hood somewhere there is a merge. Yeah. So sync, technically it's the same thing. Is that a VS code? Is that VS code terminology? For maybe, but I think stuff. maybe it refers to the like the, the button on GitHub where you where you sync your oh, fork. Ah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then it's it is a merge, so it will do a merge for you. It yeah. will actually, it will pull the changes from the other repositories, repository, and it will merge it into your local, well, mm -hmm. into your branch on the fork. That's what happens. Yeah. So I guess we could say sync means synchronize. So that means mm -hmm. make the two, make what you're working on local, make two things look the same. Mm -hmm. And to do that, you would do merges both ways. So whatever is new in one, you merge to the other and vice versa. Yeah. Is that your interpretation? Mm -hmm. Okay. Then we have three minutes left, two questions left. We will make it. Uh, one is, can we use your learning materials that you have published yes please so they will they are reusable please use them change them one thing that is nice for us if you let us know how you use them because that makes it easier for us to report to the people who give us funding that our work is important and to please give us more money and more positions and more people so let us know how you use it we are also working on and that will hopefully happen now in april to make all the lessons citable. So they will all have a digital object identifier. They will become citable. You can then cite them. And then at some point from the citation metrics, we will be able to see where they are used and we will be able to report about it. Yeah. What if I want to part of the repository private, but the rest public? That's a great question. Um, in Git, you. You, it's either public or private. You cannot have part of it. But what you can do is that you have uh, one repository which is private and you consider one of the branches public. And I would, I would suggest keep the main branch, the one that is public, where you have the published non-secret code. And then you can mirror the one branch over to another place, another repository, which is the public one. It is relatively easy to synchronize branches between repositories. And then you can distinguish them by the branch. And you can even call it, if you don't want to call it main, you can call one of your branches public. But the repository itself has to be either or. Then somebody mentioned that you can also use submodules. Submodules is a way of, you can have Git repositories inside other Git repositories. We didn't show that because that's another layer of possible complexity and options. In our remaining One time, minute. should we talk about what to expect for next week? We can come back to more random Q&A. Yeah. So yes. Uh, under day three, if you scroll up a bit, I started some news there. So today we covered the things listed on the schedule. There were three exercises there. Next week will be different than this week. So instead of having lots of time for the exercises, we will have more time, like we'll have more demonstrations. So we'll show something more advanced and then it will be up to you to do it yourself after the course, if you would like. This is something new we're trying this week. Mm -hmm. And this is partly because the exercises start to get so involved that everyone needs, has their own pathway to do it. So we can't really support it and it just needs more time than we can give during the um, the session itself. Mm -hmm. But you will see the same, like it's the same spirit of what we're doing this week. But instead of focusing on just the Git technology, we focus on how to use Git plus a lot of other things to make better research. So 
yeah. There will still, if you then want to work on exercises on your own, you can. But the nice thing about week two is that invite your friends, invite your colleagues. They can come for just one session mm -hmm. and they can come unprepared. They don't have to install anything. Right. It's really about yeah. watching and asking questions and getting inspired. That's the goal for next week. So we really hope to see you there. We will start then on Tuesday, nine o'clock Stockholm time, 10 o'clock Finland time. Is there some summer summertime change? Maybe. So let's be careful. Uh, I don't know when the summertime shift is. is. Is it this weekend? Yeah. Nice thing about our schedule is that it automatically adapts to your time zone on the workshop schedule. It should hopefully all work. Yeah. I think we have amazing timing. We are. That was a good day, a good week. Yeah, right on time. I'd say. Yeah. All of Radovan's efforts at rewriting the stuff or improving the stuff definitely paid off. So, do we head out yeah. then? Yes, let's thank to everybody involved in first week. There is a lot of work that is not immediately visible to make this run smooth. We will work on publishing the Q&A. Praying for week two. We hope to see you all there and even more people. And thanks, Gregor. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, everybody else. And uh, have a nice afternoon and rest of the week. Just Richard, one more thing yes. I wanted to say. So, yeah, so this, we, we're really proud of this course and think that it's a really high quality course in the academic, like, university system. So, if you like this, please tell your friends. And in order for it to continue, we need more people to help us because. We're just a few people. There's many watchers. We're getting tired. Um, so tell people around your organizations. And sometime we will be looking for more partners to sustain this in the future. Maybe the best thing to do is sign up to the Code Refinery newsletter or follow us on one of the social medias and see whenever we ask for help references partners then send us to people at your institution and ask to um ask ask if you can join yes okay that's it so we'll keep answering questions as usual oh um, super yeah great thanks everybody i will click on the button i don't know whether jingle plays or not but see you soon Thanks, okay. everybody. Bye. Bye.